The 2021 Year of Fun Game Development Competition has concluded. It was a pretty good turnout. Quite a few developers showed that you can build a game with hype. Now that it's 2022, the goal for Photix is to create a game for Apple Arcade. Phew, that's been more difficult than I thought. But the words from MatPat are motivating. If you're a budding game developer, coronavirus might just have opened up the most exciting opportunity of your life. 2021 is your chance. Am I too late? Eh, probably not. So while figuring things out, I remembered about Tumult Hype. The next video on the list is game related, and it could help with my game project. And even though the A3 template was created for Hype projects, it's basically vanilla JavaScript. If you're making web games with JavaScript, this video could be helpful. So, where do we start? Well, we can start where we left off. In the last Hype video, the FPS gauge was not very robust. It only showed the frame rate for the latest frame. It's also not very performant. Apparently, it was using 12.5% of CPU usage. Although, I was using a 2009 Mac Mini back then. This code is almost 6 years old. What would I change today? Hmm, I might not use VAR, but Hype still supports old versions of Internet Explorer. So, if your litmus test for good code is the appearance of VAR, know that there is a reason it's being used here. This explains the block of code at the top. I'm just creating the names of the variables. There are comments on each line that explain the purpose of each variable. The general idea is that we'll have a little chart that shows the history of the frames per second. Every second, the chart will update. That's why the first two variables exist, FPS and frames. The first variable is the final FPS value for the current second, while the second variable is for counting the number of frames in the current second. Every second, the data array is updated with a new FPS value which records about a minute of FPS values. This information is then displayed with Scalable Vector Graphics, SVG. This explains the other variables. That SVG image is created dynamically, with custom coloring to highlight when the frame rate is low. To add the SVG image to the web page, we need a box to put it in. That's the div element. That's just a standard HTML box. However, there is some styling going on here. The div element is given an ID of FPS, but you can call it something else. But if you do change it, just remember that you'll need that new name later in the code. The div is positioned at the top left of the screen. That's the purpose of the next three lines. Once again, the location of the box is something that you can customize. The box is given a mostly white transparent background to make the chart easier to read. Styling is also up to you. The point here was to make the chart stand out. As a comparison, the developer tools in Safari do show similar information, but I have trouble reading it. Also, I find it important to test my web games at full screen, as the performance drops dramatically at higher resolutions. Now that the box has a horizontal location and a vertical location, it needs width and height. That's the obvious purpose of the next two lines. However, that last line might not be so obvious. Horizontal is the X location, vertical is the Y location. The Z index is the Z location. Well, kinda. It's like sheets of paper stacked on each other. The number is huge though. Why is it over 2 billion? The 2,147,483,647 number is the maximum value for a 32-bit integer. In other words, the goal here is to place the box on the very top. You might not need a number so large. Actually, with this project, the number one works just fine. The general idea is that if you can't see the chart, then another element might be blocking it. The z-index can fix that problem. Although, we haven't actually added the element to the page yet, so that's pretty important. That's the purpose of the document.body.appendChild line. The element created is being added to the page. Specifically, the new element is being added to the body element. 
but you could add the new element to another element on the page. The body tag was chosen because it makes this code easier to cut and paste into another project, as web pages usually have a body element. The next part is just zeroing out the data array. If you're not sure what's going on, and after six years I didn't quite remember either, you can just use the console log to show the values of the data array. After seeing what was going on, I simplified this part. It used to use splice, which seemed unnecessarily complicated. Now it's simply using the push method. Remember, visit photix.com to download the latest version of this template. But in other words, this little loop adds zeros to the array. There are other ways to simplify this even further, but I wanted the most recent FPS bar to be at the right of the chart. Remember, you don't have to love the code. The important part is to understand what's going on. That way, you can customize this code to better suit your project. So now, we're getting to the actual frame counting. If you remember from the last FPS video, we covered request animation frame. If you haven't seen that video, you might want to watch that before continuing with this video. But basically, the video explains how request animation frame is used to run code only when a new frame is being displayed. This is great for detecting the speed in which frames appear. Whenever a new frame is drawn, the frame's variable is increased by one. That's all the frame function does. It's an endless loop. However, it can't start itself. That's the point of the next line. It starts the frame function. The next section of code is for the total function. It starts off with its own set of variables and changes to the data array. The function starts by removing the first value of the data array. Since the FPS chart runs indefinitely, it shouldn't collect numbers infinitely. The first line of the function removes the oldest FPS value from the start of the array, and then adds a new FPS value as the last row of the array. This next line is a little redundant, but I'm leaving it because I like that everything is in one section. It also helps with understanding what's going on. The FPS value is the number of frames recorded in the last second. Once we have that value, the frames variable is reset. So that process starts all over again. This next part, <laughs> it's a little confusing, but basically the SVG image is being built from scratch. That means it even has to start with an SVG tag and the appropriate attributes. Then, for each value in the data array, a line is drawn. Each new line is slightly more to the right than the line previously drawn. The whole SVG code is added as HTML to the FPS div element that was created earlier. This happens once every 1000 milliseconds. The end result is an FPS gauge that is better than the one in the previous video. This doesn't mean that the new FPS gauge is the best one ever. Rather, it's to look at the core JavaScript concepts. This little project is not just about building an FPS gauge. It's also about creating vector images dynamically based on data from an array. That's really powerful, especially considering that the JavaScript is less than 88 lines of code. Anyway, hopefully that information helps you out. Thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about Tumult Hype, you might like a book about hype.